welcome. My name is Kostas Konstantinou. I work at the University of Cyprus. It's a great honor to be introducing Professor Jonathan Osborne from Stanford University. Jonathan started as a teacher in inner city schools in London and then moved to King's College London where he tried his hands at uh, the teacher preparation program in science and then grew into a professorship until a few years ago when he moved across the pond and has been working for a number of years now at Stanford. In my own reading, I have always felt the need to look at um, Jonathan's writing in detail. Any time I have had to think about students working with phenomena and theory building, connecting evidence with knowledge claims. And I have found his writing always to be very well researched, very thoughtful, um, very informative, very useful for anything, for all aspects that relate to education, including curriculum design, teacher professional development, teacher training, and also educational assessment. I know he has been very inspirational to the whole science education research community. In Cyprus, some of our best faculty in science education research have been trained by Jonathan. Jonathan is also quite unique in the community in how he has worked very thoughtfully about connecting science education research with um, the students' experience and with teaching efforts, the tools that teachers use, but also with policy making in uh, science education. It's a great pleasure to have you here. We'll give you a bit less than an hour to listen to your presentation, and then we'll have about half an hour for an open discussion. Thank you, Jonathan. Welcome. Thank you very much, Costas, again for the introduction. Uh, you can uh, hear by the accent that I'm not an American. Uh, I have had the privilege of working in America for ten and a half years at Stanford, uh, which has been a, an enlightening experience in many ways. Uh, and I'm now uh, just about to retire uh, back to the UK. Uh, this too is a rather daunting experience. I don't think I've ever stood in front of a kind of such a sort of a vertical lecture theatre looking up at so many people. Uh, and uh, really what I, I think want to do um, is to talk about this topic of argumentation interaction and learning in science education. As Costa said, you know, my roots are very much uh, fundamentally in the classroom and that's the kind of perspective I think that you will get uh, from me. Uh, this topic is dear to my heart, um, partly because obviously I have a kind of obsession with improving the teaching and learning of science uh, and I think in presenting what you might say is a more accurate vision of, of science. So. Uh, what I want to do in this talk, what I want to try and do is make a case for why argument is central to any understanding of science. Um, then I want to look at uh, what we have found from some of the attempts. Obviously, I'm going to talk about some of my attempts, but I also like to talk about uh, other people's attempts to make it part of the common practice of science education. What we've learned from that process uh, and what they, we might learn from uh, other fields uh, of science education. Because I don't think really what I'm talking about is particularly unique to science. Many of the issues that I raise uh, I think you can find across all kinds of classrooms. So first of all, I need to um, disabuse you, I think, of the view that school science uh, is uh, about certainty. Okay? Uh, sadly, I think for uh, what you might say, too many students, essentially. Uh, the impression they're left with science is that it's about the unequivocal, the unquestioned, the uncontested, uh, and essentially what a colleague of mine has described as final form science. Now, how, how might I kind of uh, disabuse you of, of that? Because apart from doing a disservice to science, it also does a disservice to our students uh, who never are afforded the experience of the core of science, that it's the pursuit of scientific knowledge 
is about resolving uncertainty and that the resolution requires the evaluation of plural alternatives. Okay, in short, the argument is a key feature to science. Now, it's not particularly difficult to offer students this experience, and I'm going to offer uh, one of those to you by uh, asking you to think about uh, some of the arguments that there might be against the standard canonical explanation for day and night, which I'm sure you all believe it's something you virtually absorbed uh, at your mother's knee uh, in that sense. But I'm, I'm going to ask you to just uh, think about it for a moment and say, well, you know, there are quite good arguments against this. First of all, there's the one that the sun blatantly appears to move. It, if you got up early this morning, you would have seen it in the east. And if it's still around or not covered by cloud in the evening, you'll see it in the west. So clearly, observation tells you that the sun moves. Uh, and then a kind of moment's thought about this says, well, if the sun, you know, if the earth is spinning as you say, surely if you jumped up, you wouldn't land in the same spot. Uh, and then if you've really got some kind of clever person in your class, they'd work out that actually to go around once in 24 hours means that you are going at over a thousand miles at the equator, which is faster than the speed of sound. So the question is, why do you all uh, believe this uh, in that sense? Uh, and uh, this simply is because there are certain things that we take on trust from people who are in authority, and that is the warrant that we use to justify these kinds of beliefs in that sense. Most of you, I suspect, could not tell me the evidence that for the standard scientific explanation. Now, just in case you're worried at this point in time, let me point you to some of the evidence in that sense, because I think it illustrates one or two good points about science. First of all, this is one of the standard pieces of evidence, which is the large Foucault pendulum, which you see in science centers, where over a period of time, these little balls gradually get knocked down by this big pendulum, which appears to be turning and yet it's on a frictionless pivot. And the explanation which Foucault put forward in 1861 is that this is caused by the fact that the ground underneath is turning. Uh, and people flocked in their thousands then to see this for the first time. Second piece of evidence is this, okay, uh, which is a kind of interesting piece of evidence because it raises, I think, uh, an issue that's kind of key to science. Uh, this is a photograph of the night sky taken with the camera uh, left open, pointed at the pole star, in this case, the southern pole star, and uh, left open for eight hours, and uh, then you get these tracks of the stars appearing to turn like this. Now, there are two possible explanations. One is that all those stars are turning around that central star, or that the camera on the ground is on the ground which is turning. And you can't decide on the basis of that evidence which one of those is correct. And this is where science essentially calls on a value which is enunciated by a 14th century monk called William of Ockham, called Ockham's Razor, uh, which basically says, don't go for the uh, complicated explanation in that sense, though you put it in a slightly more sophisticated way than that. The modern version of it is the KISS principle called keep it simple stupid in that sense. Uh, and uh, the simple explanation uh, is that the camera on the ground is turning and that is it. And so that's what we go for. And it points to the fact that some of the arguments in science are resolved by values, i.e. our belief in elegance and simplicity. Uh, and another good example of this is um, uh, you can be found in the story about the discovery of DNA in the BBC Horizon program. Uh, and I show here this clip where Crick is explaining to Watson why the structure is fundamentally uh, right, uh, illustrating this particular value. That's it, isn't it? That's it. That surely is it. <laughs> I feel like Pygmalion. You build something beautiful when it comes to life. All we wanted was the body and we've got the soul. That's how it is, Jim. Isn't that how it is? That's how it is. The secret of life itself. 
peel the chains apart and each chain reproduces the other. One becomes two, two becomes one, generation on generation, all the way from Adam and Eve to you and me. It never dies, Jen. It never dies. One simple shape. The womb of humanity, endlessly, effortlessly fertile, dividing, reforming itself from the beginning to the end of the world. It's the closest we'll ever get to immortality, Jim. I knew it would be pretty. And as he says, you know, he knew it would be pretty, and, and that was a particular value. I'm not, I doubt if at the time they put it quite so elegantly, but it's a nice way of uh, putting what is one of the major discoveries of the 20th century. Now, I show you these examples um, because they show, I think, in, in science, how uh, essentially all arguments are Bayesian inferences where you have to evaluate more than one explanation. Okay, which one is the most likely and the most possible? Uh, and Crick and Watson are arguing on the basis that this is the simplest, the prettiest, uh, and they were fairly rude about alternative suggestions that were around at the time. Many of these arguments, unfortunately, in the context of, I think, science teaching, are so lost in the history of time that the intellectual achievement they represent, I think, has been lost. Richard Dawkins puts it well when he says, there's an anesthetic of familiarity, a sedative of ordinariness, which dulls the senses and hides the wonders of existence. And I think in the case of much teaching, science hides the wonder of how it is that we came to know what we now know. For instance, I think all of you believe that the air is full of tiny living microbes, colloquially entitled germs. You don't doubt this at all. Now, given that you've never seen these things, your belief in is at least questionable. You know, is it some kind of nice narrative we tell ourselves about how we get ill or get sick? And you have to go back to the turn of the 18th, 19th century to know that there was a raging debate going on about what caused these... Uh, us to get sick and what caused food to go off. There were two competing theories at the time between those who argued that food spontaneously went bad in that sense, and then there was the French uh, man Louis Pasteur who was arguing that it was caused by tiny living uh, micro microorganisms. And if you look at it, Stanford, um, uh, Pasteur devised a very clever little experiment to determine in that sense what the answer was, which is essentially a long flask uh, of this nature, okay, into which you could put some kind of soup or broth uh, uh, with that one labeled J, and it had a bend in it like that. And his argument essentially was, if spontaneous generation ha de de degeneration happened, it would go off spontaneously regardless of the bend. But if it was tiny microbes, okay, then when they came down into the bend, they would settle in the bend and not be able to go round and get into the broth and make it go off. Uh, and uh, in this case, the evidence uh, was definitely on Pasteur's side. And that, in some senses, is how we have come to believe uh, in these things. So lest you, I think, are any doubt, and this is my point, um, as Alastair Crombie argues in his um, three-volume a uh, study of styles of scientific thinking in the Western tradition. Um, the, the history of science, in that sense, is a history of vision and argument. These ideas have all had to be argued for, uh, uh, and this essentially uh, is what's happened. But also, I think the other way of seeing it, and this is what people forget because they get lost, is that science is a history of mistakes. Uh, and if you look at them, some of these mistakes you're possibly familiar with, the idea of phlogiston, spontaneous generation I just mentioned, the ether, cold fusion, Lamarckianism, caloric theory are some of the more well-known ones. But it is up to scientists in some senses to test their ideas and make state, mistakes. And this essentially is how science proceeds. Science is a body of ideas about the material world that represent one of those great intellectual achievements uh, of our contemporary society. And you forget, I think, that the nature of that transformation. Um, this man, for instance, uh, Giordano Bruno, was burned at the stake in uh, the main square in Rome a little over 400 years ago for preaching that the earth went round the sun. Uh, you'll be pleased to know 
that the Romans recognized their mistake and later decided to uh, put up a statue uh, to, in his honor from that point of view. But any, I think, by espousing or exploring some of the arguments okay, for these ideas, can you start to help people to understand what, in some senses, a great enterprise and achievement science is? The conservative uh, uh, philosopher Michael Oakeshott, British philosopher, uh, I recognize the centrality of ideas to science when he said this, scientific experience begins neither with the collection of data, nor with measurement, neither with experiment, nor with observation, but with the world of scientific ideas. Ideas about how what we observe might be explained. And hence, what I would argue is that in some senses, and I think the, the task of teaching science would be a lot better or easier if the teacher of science saw themselves as a teacher of uh, crazy ideas. Um, here, for instance, is a small section uh, of my long list of crazy ideas that teachers of science have to teach. I think I've talked about the first one. Uh, the continents have moved. Okay, well, this is a very difficult idea to accept. How could you move a building like this, let alone a continent? Uh, we have evolved from other animals. We don't talk about that one because there's lots of people who still have difficulty with that one. Um, the Earth is five billion years old. Okay, how do you know? I talked about the next one. We live at the bottom of a sea of air. And then essentially the Crick and Watson one, that you look like your parents because every cell carries a chemically coded message about how to reproduce yourself. How can that be, you know, that each cell carries the blueprint uh, that will uh, take, uh, take us, uh, make another new one of us? So people have to be persuaded to believe such idea. And that's why that makes argument in science a core feature. And any model of what we are trying to communicate in science, the story we should wish to tell about science, has to put argument at its core which is why this particular diagram, I think, is key to the American document, a framework for K-12 science education. Uh, and it's a picture that uh, was developed by myself and my graduate student, Evan Zhu, to represent that, drawing on the work of Ron Gear. And what it basically says is that there are three spheres of activity in science. There is the investigation space, which is on the left one, which I think is most, what most people think of in terms of science. Is, you know, science is empiricist, they go out and collect data, okay, and then they test uh, something, but it's a bit vague as to what they are testing. And then on the right-hand side, okay, there's the developing explanations and solutions, and this gets undervalued. My simple test of how this is undervalued in some senses is to ask you all, and you have to, th to just the first name that comes into your mind, to think of a famous scientist. Moment for that. Okay. Then my question to you is, is your famous scientist famous for a th new theory okay, or a new experiment? So can we just have a quick hands up? Okay, how many of you thought of a scientist who was famous for a theory? Okay. And how many of you thought of a scientist that was famous for an experiment? think that proves my point. Okay? You get your name in lights in science for developing a new idea or a new theory about the world. However, I think for the subject of what this talk is, uh, is about, what really matters is that third space, which is the space devoted to the evaluation of ideas, argument and critique. Because scientists are imaginative people, they do have lots of ideas about the world, but as I said, many of those ideas are, are wrong. And you can't present an account of science which doesn't give students an opportunity uh, to experience that. Uh, but as I said, the problem is that this is not common experience. Uh, students are commonly presented with final form science, and the experience is, as another colleague of mine, Guy Claxton, put it, okay, uh, it's rather like being on a train with blacked out windows. Okay, you know you're going somewhere, but only the train driver really knows where. So lost too, I think, is an opportunity, if we don't use argument, to use a practice which is a large body of research has shown is effective for student learning. So what is the evidence then uh, on learning? 
Now, the answer to that is that there are a lot of small-scale studies, each of which I would see as offering another brick in the wall of evidence that the research community has slowly been constructing. Time being what it is, I shall simply refer, I think, to two notable contributions to start with. The first is by Mickey Chi of Arizona, uh, at the Uni uh, University of Arizona, uh, who in a seminal meta-analysis uh, of the link between pedagogy and learning outcomes showed that interactive approaches that require dialogue and, and obviously interaction with the production of a product were better than those that were simply constructive Okay, in the sense that they uh, required a uh, production of a product, which were better than those which were active uh, uh, and which were better than those which were passive. Although I've never actually really worked out exactly what it means to be a passive learner because I don't think you can really learn in that kind of way. But what I think the important thing here is about the language is that we need to talk about interactive learning and not just simply active learning in that sense. Second piece of evidence, okay, is a study presented by Robin Alexander in a keynote given at the early SIG uh, uh, on argu argumentation last year. And in his work in the UK, using a randomized controlled trial with nearly 5,000 fourth grade students and 208 teachers, an independent evaluation showed that after 20 weeks, Students in the intervention group were two months ahead of their peers in a control group in English, mathematics, and science tests. And the coded video showed that changes in both teacher and student talking were striking and in the direction required. So there are only two pieces of evidence, but there are many more. Uh, and I think this shouldn't really be surprising because, as Michael Ford has argued, okay, the construction of knowledge is a dialectic between construction and critique. And this is something which I think I argued in this paper in Science in 2010. Knowing why you're wrong matters as much as knowing why you're right. And in the case of science, nothing could be more true. Knowing why the argument that air has no mass, why current is not conserved in a simple circuit, or why genetic adaptation cannot take place within one lifetime are all central to understanding why air does have mass, why current is conserved in a simple circuit, and why evolution is a product of favorable genetic mutations which occur between one generation and the next. As Bacalard, the earlier 20th century philosopher, pointed out, truth is the product of difference and not fond consensus. And it's the reintroduction of the exploration of difference that's essential if science education is to cast off the shackles of, of just simply being a proper duty training for the next generation of scientists. So I think that's what I'm trying to sort of, I, I made the argument, I think, for argument in that sense. I really want to turn to uh, the issue of how it's done and what we can learn from that in that sense. It is not difficult to do this. There are, you know, there are lots of resources that uh, I think are enabling for teachers. All it requires is the introduction of plural alternatives and structures for supporting discussion and debate. So the work uh, that um, Brenda Keogh uh, 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 and Stuart Naylor have done in the UK on developing these rich resources of concept cartoons, uh, which enable students to discuss scientific ideas and also have the great value, which is that you're not discussing your idea, you're discussing somebody else's idea. So they have been a good vehicle uh, for introducing argumentation. There are arguments to be had about, say, which is the best design for an experiment. For instance, which is the best design to investigate the effect of temperature on how much sugar dissolves in water by presenting different alternatives in that sense. There are also arguments to be had about data and their interpretation. So for instance, this is one example I commonly use. If you have a set of data of breaths, per minute against pulse beats per minute. It is not, as you would expect, a magical straight line. There is some fluctuation and variation. So in that sense then, if you have to summarize what that shows, which one of these is the best summary? Is it one pupil had most breaths and she also had the highest pulse rate? Or all the pupil with a high breath rate had a high pulse rate? 
or the higher your breathing rate, the greater the pulse rate, or on the whole, those people with a higher breath rate had a higher pulse rate. And you can do this with, I think, essentially any set of data. Um, at a, what you might call a more sophisticated level, what I think um, excites me at the moment is the introduction of tools for analyzing more complex data sets, which mean that you don't have to be some kind of expert with Excel. You can plot one set of data against another, look at the patterns, and start to interrogate what the issues are. In this case, it's the weight of dinosaurs against the millions of years ago when they actually lived. Okay, and there is some kind of vague, slight correlation with a lot of uh, variation. But what is the relationship? Uh, and you then start to engage, in some senses, in a more authentic experience of what science is. So the issue is not that there is neither the opportunity nor the means to achieve this goal of implementing argumentation in science education. Rather, the issue is whether there is evidence sufficient to convince teachers of the value of argumentation and whether there is a willingness in the body politic of teachers to enact this practice. Let me, I think, turn to the first of this about the evidence. Um, as I said, I've shown you some of it, but there's also suffice to say that some of it's considerable given that argumentation has been a program of research in science education now and in other subjects, I think, going back over 20 years. Good reviews of that evidence can be found, as I pointed out to you, in my own paper in Science, but that you also find a lot of it uh, in this book by, um, uh, the, the, this is the book by um, uh, um, Lauren Resnick on socializing intelligence, which is a good summary of much of the work of uh, some of the people who are here. Uh, and then uh, in this one, uh, one here by Krista Astahan and Baruch Schwartz uh, on uh, argumentation for learning. This is the most recent one, uh, and in this I'll kind of draw on as a frame for some of the things I'm going to talk about, because what they say there is that there are essentially th really three features that you can uh, consider. Uh, there are in uh, inhibitors and enablers of argumentation, there are characteristics of the dialogue which you need to look at, and then there are the learning of these outcomes. So turning to the first of these, inhibitors and enablers of argumentation, what have we actually learnt? Well, essentially, it's the teacher's task to foster an environment in which productive and deliberative argumentation can take place. Uh, and to this end, it's important to be clear about the goal, which is dialectic and deliberative argumentation. It's not the construction of explanation per se, although that's the, what the outcome you might want. There is a difference between explanation and argument uh, which is something that I, I and my student, Alexis Patterson, uh, have written back uh, about. But that difference matters. It's also important to avoid disputed uh, argumentation, as that's not productive. And to that end, it's important to put the idea under discussion to the fore in a way that it is not owned by any individual. And there are tools here which I think are important. Some of them are technological, such as the platforms like Socrative, Cahoots, uh, and Brain Candy. Uh, there are other things like this, which are simple tools you can use, which are argument lines, where students are asked to identify with one end of the argument or the other end of the argument and engage in a discussion about why they are where they are. Okay, or another version of this is Four Corners. Okay, so for instance, should we reintroduce wolves into California? A highly contentious topic in that sense. And again, to identify with one corner of the room and to justify why they stand where they are. Nevertheless, okay, enabling argumentation requires the skill of the teacher to problematize a salient issue. That in turn, and I think this is an issue that I'm increasingly aware of, requires a good conceptual grasp of the domain and the underlying issues. So for instance, asking students to debate the question of is a seed alive is a good question because it raises the issue of what distinguishes a living from a non-living organism. Asking students to debate what is the most important organ in the body, which I've seen some teachers do, okay, is not a good question because basically there is no good answer to that kind of question. They're all important. So as Christine Chin and I argued in a paper in 2010, knowing what makes a productive question is one of the key enablers of argumentation. 
And the issue that we're faced with, I think, in some senses, is how do you educate people to ask those good questions? So, for instance, consider a question like, question stem like, what's the difference? This is a good enabler of deliberation. What's the difference between photosynthesis and respiration? What's the difference between heat and temperature? A question which many people with physics degrees have difficulty answering. Okay. And what's the difference between a physical change and a chemical change? And you have that potential for productive deliberation. And that's, I think, kind of segue to the second of these issues, which is what are the characteristics of the dialogue? Just because the structures exist for eliciting and supporting difference, in and of itself, it is no guarantee that it will happen. Those who see argument as war may simply attempt to browbeat their opponent okay, and, and suffer, and while they suffer from confirmation bias and an inability to listen. Anybody who's had an attempt to argue with a Brexit supporter, okay, as I have, can tell you about that. Okay? But depending upon gender, motivation, and social norms that exist in the classroom milieu, students may, achieve to pref may, may prefer to achieve some kind of quick consensus unless the structure is demanding that they go above and beyond facile disputation. So there, you know, there are tools here which I think, again, have been valuable, have been researched, the use of refutation texts, which introduce the alternatives and consider why they might be wrong or valuable. The work that had been done, just one example, but there are other examples by uh, um, other projects on the use of productive talk moves that establish norms for discussion are, again, extremely valuable in framing what it is that we value about this kind of discussion. So when it comes to the third of these, the learning outcomes, as Asterheim and Schwartz point out, the evidence of a causal link between argumentation and domain-specific knowledge gains are few. Much of the evidence, given the dominance of the learning science, is based on small-scale studies uh, and taking the form of rather detailed descriptions uh, and uh, often obviously showing that this has been successful and you know, I'd be the first to admit that I have contributed some of those as well. Providing evidence is a challenge. It would require large-scale studies w uh, w uh, where argumentation is the isolated as the independent variable and in the underfunded and highly competitive world of educational research it's difficult to do that. I'd argue, though, that there is sufficient body of evidence, and some of the best evidence comes from um, the physics education community, uh, where they have been using this, or attempting to use this form of deliberative discussion in lectures uh, to enhance student learning, uh, and have many studies which uh, are amalgamated in this paper published by Carl Wyman, uh, one of my colleagues at Stanford. Uh, and he shows in this graph here the difference, the significant difference between the percentage achievement and the, uh, the, the achievement of the students in their test score, uh, and that difference is significant. Uh, and that's people engaging students in deliberative discussions, in, often in large lecture theatres like this, where students are asked to turn and talk. Uh, part of the, you know, I think it's also worth remembering that even with evidence like this, and this is an issue, I think, that we have to face as a community, okay, this is not a common pr practice in the physics education community. Things are shifting, as you might say, slowly. Part of the reason is that argumentation is only one tool in the repertoire of the toolbox of the skilled teacher. It may simply be best for complex ideas, and there are other things that are taught more effectively, and we have to recognize that. And I don't think we are, any of us are promoting this as simply being the answer uh, to everything. But what I do want to do, I think, at this point is to say is that, uh, you know, given the, what well, you might say, limited, uh, limited evidence, okay, one of the things we have to remember is that education is a value-driven activity. And even if the evidence is equivocal in that sense, there, uh, and there's much that we cannot answer, so for instance, who gains more, the high ability students who engage in argumentation or the low ability students who engage in, you know, in argumentation, we have limited answers to that one. Okay. There is a moral and social case or argument for why we should do more of this. 
The first, I think, is moral, and it's put simply is the argument made by my late colleague Stephen Norris. Okay. And here what he says is to ask of other human beings that they accept and memorize what the science teacher says without any concern for the meaning and justification of what is said is to treat those human beings with disrespect and is to show insufficient care for their welfare. It treats them with disrespect because students exist on a moral par with their teachers and therefore have the right to expect from their teachers reasons for what teachers wish them to believe. It shows insufficient care for the welfare of students because possessing beliefs that one is unable to justify is poor currency when one needs beliefs that can reliably guide action. Now, okay, I don't want to make the case that everything has to be argued from evidence. There just simply isn't enough time in that sense. But it does mean that there should be opportunities for students to engage with the evidence for some of the things uh, that we want them to, uh, to do. Yeah, the evidence we have gathered from the detailed classroom studies of science teaching in the late 90s showed that deliberative discussion was marked by its absence. 20 years later, okay, this is some data from one of my graduate students looking at the work of three exemplary science teachers in the Bay Area. One's the fourth, fifth grade teacher, one's the eighth grade, and one is the ninth grade. And again, you can see that argumentation is not what you might say a strong feature of the classroom. So there is much work to be done. Now in that sense, it's gratifying for those of you who were Eckhard Klima's presentation yesterday that his research does show that there is more, uh, more of a move, there has been a move to a more dialogic, uh, interactive approach in many classrooms. So I think we are moving this way. It's slow, but the arguments have to be made. The social argument for, uh, for argumentation is it develops the literate skills increasingly demanded by a complex society in which we live. So those of you, I think, who are dispirited by the progress in education, uh, I would recommend this book by David Baker on the school society, where he makes the very important point that in a little over a hundred years, we have gone from a society where education was the privilege of a few to one where education is now considered to be a universal human right. In addition, what he points, at, points to, and I think this is something that uh, this program of work is about, is the change in the demands of education. And he uses this particular piece of data to illustrate this. This is an analysis of math problems in textbooks from 1904 to, I think, just about 2000. Uh, on the left is the level of conceptual abstraction. On the right is the number of problem-solving strategies. This is what's happened with the level of conceptual abstraction. It's increased on the whole. And this is what's happened about the requirement for the number of problem-solving strategies. It, too, has increased in that way. So our expectations of uh, education, uh, in that sense, are increasing. We are demanding or wanting to educate students to higher levels of competencies in that way. And this is how OECD PISA uh, now examines and uh, defines what is to be valued, because it does it in terms of three competencies that it essentially says it's assessing. Can students explain phenomena scientifically? Can they evaluate and design scientific inquiry? And can they interpret data and evidence scientifically? So it's not just a case of what you can know, it's a case of what you can actually do with the knowledge that you have. And you see this again uh, written into the Next Generation Science Standards in the sense that the outcomes are defined in terms of performance expectations. Can students analyze and interpret data on the properties of a substance before and after the substances interact to determine if a chemical reaction has occurred? So there is, in that sense, a shift that is occurring, uh, I think. Uh, and such competencies can't be developed by a pedagogy that sees knowledge as something which is to be transmitted. Okay. Such competencies are only going to be acquired by students engaging in the epistemic practices of defining, explaining, critiquing, and arguing. Uh, and that means opportunities for argument and deliberation have to be a consistent feature of science 
and a consistent feature of all subjects. Another, I think, argument from the social perspective okay, is to some extent what you might call the citizenship argument uh, in that sense, is, which is that we need to foster a respect for evidence uh, and what it actually shows. And if evidence is not put to the fore in the classroom, if science is taught as dogma, then like any other system of beliefs, okay, it will potentially be rejected. I mean, I think we would all like our students, obviously, to believe in climate change, to accept the arguments for vaccination, uh, and to accept the evidence that there is for evolution. Those, I think, are complex topics in some senses because some of them are identity related. Okay. Why then, I think, are tackle the mountain in that sense? Why not begin in the foothills by sh showing simpler things for which we have the evidence? Okay. And th th this is a fundamental commitment in some senses to what knowledge is about and answering that question of how we know. That's a commitment just, not just to helping students to understand what we know, but more fundamentally to how we know and why it matters and how it came to be. And I think that's tremendously important. So I hope at this point that I've convinced you about the role of argumentation and it's important. More fundamentally, uh, uh, I think this is not a research program in some senses we should lose faith in because there isn't you know, absolutely conclusive evidence uh, of, of its value. Uh, but it, it, this is a necessary aspect of society. For me, I think focusing on this line of work over the past 15 years has been how we can help to train teachers to deliver what is a complex and demanding pedagogy. Uh, the, the need to do this, uh, I think, emerged from the first piece of work uh, I engaged in uh, nearly 20 years ago now, uh, looking at how you could enhance the quality of argumentation uh, in school science. We had three research questions driving this particular way, work. Essentially, could we identify some of the pedagogical strategies necessary to promote argument skills in young people in science lessons? Could we trial the pedagogical strategies and determine the extent to which their implementation enhanced teachers' pedagogic practice with argument? And could we determine the extent to which the lessons that follow these pedagogical strategies led to enhanced quality in students' arguments? Now, time doesn't permit me to go through the design and findings of this study in detail. The major message that emerged from a close Toolman-based analysis of the data was that students did get better at argumentation over the course of a year. Analyzing 12 teacher videotapes and 25 videotapes of student groups from the beginning of the school year and comparing them with a similar sample at the end of the year, okay, classifying each of the arguments into one of five levels ranging from what is a level one argument to a simple claim to the highest, a level five, which consisted of an argument with more than one rebuttal, we found that there was this shift between pre and post in that sense. And in some senses, this study, I think, was a kind of proof of concept that it was possible uh, to do this particular work. In addition, by working with the teachers, we had learned much about the nature of the task and the challenge. Uh, and I think this uh, led us to recognize that if we were going to take this forward, and I think the community as a whole uh, is engaged in this in different kinds of ways, and this was our first attempt at this, uh, we needed a set of video-based materials that could support teachers' professional learning. Uh, if teachers are going to be asked to enact a practice that they have never seen, it's very difficult. So they need opportunities to see something uh, and for it to be uh, what, what it is that we're being asked to do. Now, all those materials are now old videos and what you might term English-centric. There's still much, I think, of value to be found in them, particularly in some of the um, exercises that we put with the videos. One revelation, for instance, was an exercise which required teachers to justify uh, the, or the evidence for these particular concepts. You know, plants get most of their matter from photosynthesis, the day and night one I've talked about. Uh, it's interesting when you do that one with teachers, I would say only about 
5% of teachers know one piece of evidence. Uh, matter is conserved in a chemical reaction. Uh, or why we live at the bottom uh, of a sea, of, or what's the evidence for living at the bottom of a sea of air? Now, teachers find this difficult. And what this points to is that okay, too much of the science is taught without an evidence based argument because they have to think or hard about what the evidence is. And it points to the enormity, I think, of the transformation that we have to make in the cultural habitus uh, of teachers of science. Um, the nature of that challenge, I think, became clearer in our next project, which was uh, a study in four schools. We, I think, were wonderfully overambitious and thought, well, maybe we can uh, uh, get this practice embedded in four schools. Uh, if we work with uh, four schools, uh, we can take it to scale. Okay. Each of the teacher leaders attended five days of professional development across two years. Uh, they then ran a number of sessions for their colleagues, generally after school, uh, and then using a set of validated and reliable tests, we measured the changes in their students' abstract reasoning, their epistemic beliefs about science, and their engagement with learning, and compared them with a similar set from uh, uh, other schools. Uh, and the overall picture is that we made no difference. Okay. Uh, which is, I think, you can imagine, if your research is always disappointing, uh, but uh, it still published it, and I published it on the basis and made the argument then, would make the argument now, that in some senses knowing what doesn't work is as important as knowing what does work. Uh, and clearly this doesn't work in that sense, uh, and transforming teacher practice is much harder uh, than we had imagined. So it's pleasing then to some extent uh, that in a more recent study that I've conducted with my colleague uh, Hilda Borko, uh, working with the Lawrence Hall of Science who ran the professional development with two cohorts of approximately 23 teachers okay, where the professional learning was much more extensive. Uh, we had uh, a one week uh, initial summer school and then six follow, follow up days each year for two years. So that's quite extensive in, in that kind of way. Uh, we went into their classrooms to video their practices uh, when um, uh, leading a whole class discussion at least twice, if not three times. Uh, and then we analyze um, these videos looking for specific discourse practices. Uh, one of them was ask, which is teachers' use of open-ended questing to generate productive science discourse. Uh, another one was press, which is the extent to which teachers encourage students to elaborate reasoning. Uh, and link is the extent to which teachers relate one student contribution to another exposing differences for critical evaluation. Very roughly, I would say that they find ask easier than press, which they find easier than link, uh, if you look at the number of instances. Uh, we were also looking at student practices uh, in that sense. Okay, the student practices we were looking at were um, explain claim, uh, which is the extent to which students provide extended explanations and support claims with evidence. Co-construct, which is a measure of the extent to which students build on one another's ideas, ask others to clarify, elaborate, or extend ideas. And critique, which is whether students challenge or critique one another's ideas as a measure of the extent uh, the, the context is established which supports reasoning. And again, uh, it's, it sort of seems to follow that kind of hierarchy which is critique seems to be the most, um, the hardest for students. Uh, I, you know, I don't have time to show you all the results, but if we look at the um, teacher practices, discourse practices, and aggregate them, uh, this chart, which is in the paper, shows uh, that this has led to a significant improvement in their use of these discourse practices. And as we measured it across four years, for both cohorts of teachers, cohort and cohort B, it was sustained uh, in, in that kind of way. But, and the but obviously, is that this comes at the cost of very expensive professional development, which is not sustainable, I think, in the current context where education is often at the bottom of the policy pile when it comes to uh, policy initiatives. So that being the case, okay, we have to ask, you know, what are the levers of change uh, and this is, I think, an issue that many of us, in some senses, uh, wrestle with. You know, my own particular take on this uh, recently has been living as we do in an area, era of uh, increasing accountability. 
Um, one of the major levers of change resides in the fact of what teachers are accountable for, particularly the high stakes tests. Now, here I see two positive trends. Okay. Um, the first is the movement initiated by OECD PISA, uh, testing the measurement of competencies, uh, which are best defined by Klima and Lutner as context-specific cognitive dispositions that are acquired and needed to successfully cope with certain situations or tasks in specific domains. Such competencies are a mix of domain-specific knowledge, in that sense, and its fluent application which is built through practice. Now we're not talking about the competency of the expert, something which requires the 10,000 hours that Ericsson talks about in that sense. What I think I'm talking about here is the competency akin to being able to play a simple tune, okay, which gives you some kind of insight into the nature of the enterprise okay, of what science is uh, in that sense. And it's not the virtuoso performance of the expert. And that shift to defining competency uh, okay, in that sense, notable in PISA, but also in the American NGSS, where you have an emphasis now on scientific practices and okay, whether students can actually do these kinds of things uh, uh, which require knowledge as well. So it's the, the, the shift to defining outcomes in, com in terms of competencies is important. The question then becomes, from that point of view, can we assess competencies well? Now, in that case, I think we're in essentially for the long haul. But having watched the developments in testings over the past 10 years, working as chair of the PISA Science Assessment Group, leading the Stanford Next Generation Science Assessment Project, okay, and now engaged with two funded projects on the computerized assessment of argumentation, I would argue, I think, that things are moving in the right direction. And I thought, um, I try and illustrate this, uh, which is okay, with uh, an example uh, from. Let me see if I can get across to the right place. Ah, it's logged me out, sorry. Give me a moment. Uh, okay, no, I'll go back to the PowerPoint. I've got them in the PowerPoint. It's a bit better if I can do them. Um, it'll take too long to do it that way in the interactive one. Um, what we have, um, working with Mark Wilson, uh, are computerized assessments of argumentation. Uh, and in some senses, they seem relatively simple. Uh, in this particular question, which I was going to try and show you the interactive version of this, uh, there are two graphs of how the temperature of water increases as you uh, uh, heat it uh, from, uh, well, it's ice to water, actually, from below zero to over 100 degrees. And uh, what the students are presented with is a scenario about this scenario and then two arguments. Okay, so in the next one, okay, there is an argument there uh, presented by Evan. Uh, and all the students have to do is identify which is the claim, which is the evidence, and which is the reasoning. And in the computerized version of this, they do this by clicking on the sentences that they think is the appropriate sentence and moving them into those boxes. So this is what we call a selected response item, as opposed to the more commonly version of doing this, which is to use, and which we have done in the past, a constructed response item uh, in that kind of way. What we've done in this research is to offer students the selected response uh, versions of these items and also the more open-ended constructed response item as well uh, and looked at how they compare. And the comparison uh, is shown in that sense by this particular graph which shows a scatter plot of the paired item difficulties of 13 parallel items. Um, each point reflects a correspondence between uh, the difficulty of the constructive version and the difficulty of the force choice version uh, in, that, in, in, in that sense. Uh, and the green ovals around them are the 95% uh, confidence in infidels. Um, now, if the um, constructive response had the same difficulty as the selected response, the force choice one, in that sense, uh, then they would all lie on that pink line. Uh, as it is, okay, they 
are easier by, in, in this case, what's called 1.3 logits, but they all still lie on the, apart with the exception of two of them, which are interesting anomalies, uh, on a line which is uh, of the same gradient. And what that says to us is that it is possible to write computer-based items using selected responses which test both the low-level competencies of argumentation as defined by the learning progression that I and my students produced about four or five years ago, and the higher order ones which require students to engage in critique and rebut uh, other, other arguments. And I think from that point of view, that is promising because it says, okay, we, if we can, if we want education to engage in developing these competencies, we have to say it is worth assessing. And this kind of development, I think, uh, of a computerized assessment, mainly being done by Americans, uh, is important and valuable. Now, um, uh, I think um, I'd be the first to say that you know one swallow like this doth not a summer make, uh, in that sense. But it, it uh, uh, points us in. Uh, uh, it gives me hope, I think, in that way. So I kind of thought at this point. Uh, it would be valuable, I think, to just give off you some of my concluding thoughts uh, about where we are, uh, and uh, hopefully I've given you en enough to sort of think about in terms of what needs doing. Uh, and I think the view you need to take in education, if, well, maybe it's just because I'm kind of coming to the end of my uh, uh, career in that sense, but uh, is the long view. And just over a hundred years ago, a committee appointed by the UK government after the end of the First World War, not surprisingly, to investigate the position of natural science in the educational system of Great Britain introduced its report by writing, how valuable science may be in opening the mind, in training the judgment, in stirring the imagination, and in cultivating the spirit of reverence. A nation thoroughly trained in scientific method and stirred with enthusiasm for penetrating and understanding the secrets of nature, would no doubt reap a rich material harvest of comfort and prosperity. Now, various versions of that argument have been repeated for the past hundred years, and I could point you to the reports that do that. And in my 45 years of career in science education, I've witnessed and been involved in one and other ways uh, to attempt to achieve that goal. You know, beginning with the things that the, uh, initiated by the American post -Sput Sputnik innovations, the British innovations of the Nuffield Foundation, the attempts to modernize the British curriculum uh, for the 21st century, and now the American Next Generation Science Standards. And to be truthful, each of them has founded for a variety of reasons, possibly I often think because they were over ambitious, they, in some senses, uh, overestimated the competency of the mere mortal who is the teacher of science, who has many other things on their plate and many things to do uh, okay, other than teach science. But today, I think, with the development and testing, okay, a framework, I think, which I've argued for based on styles of reasoning, and a pedagogy which increasingly recognizes the value of discussion, deliberation, and argumentation, I think we are making progress. That progress has been made by members of this research community, building and making the case for its value, and I hope I've presented some of that kind of evidence today. There is undoubtedly still much to do, uh, and at this point I kind of feel it's best to finish um, with uh, a paraphrase of the words of uh, Bertrand Russell, which is, I'm sorry that I've had to leave so many problems unsolved, I always have to make this apology, but education is rather puzzling, and I cannot help it. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much for listening, and I'm happy to answer any questions.
check. <laughs> Test. Yeah. Jonathan, I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on styles of reasoning. Um, you mentioned that right at the end. Uh, yeah, sorry, I didn't... Um, I, I, uh, I, I think basically... Uh, um, I'm trying to think where I saw it recently, okay, but basically uh, we have to have a narrative for what the sciences are about in that sense to justify it. Uh, and um, I, it's something I noticed that historians seem to have for the value of history. Okay, language arts or language teachers have it for the value of literature in that sense. But science is, uses that kind of narrative of saying, basically put it very crudely, this essentially is what will get you uh, a good job, which is a very external motivation in that kind of way. Uh, and um, the, the various attempts that have been made within the science education community to do that uh, have all founded for you know, a good variety of reasons. I mean, I could point you to you know, the big movement about to teach about the nature of science, which was a movement within the British curriculum and a movement within the American curriculum. But basically, it, its argument for the importance of science was too simplistic, and it's not something which people easily picked up, up on uh, in, that, in that kind of way. Uh, in the American Next Generation Science Standards, the attempt to do that is with uh, a chapter on what they call cross-cutting concepts. These are things which uh, are shared by all the scientists. Which, uh, the, and when you look at them, the answer is, well, yes, they are, in some senses, shared by the, by the, uh, the sciences, but so the, the, they're a kind of hodgepodge of things which have no disciplinary rationale or basis. So what has been influential most on my kind of thinking in terms of uh, the narrative for sciences is this work by Alistair Crombie on styles of reasoning, it's 20 years worth of work, so in that sense one has to respect anybody who puts 20 years worth of work into producing three volumes. And it's not just him, there are other people who are cognitive historians, and they say what matters in understanding science is not doing the kind of um, uh, work of asking people how they think and reason, because you can never really see in some people's minds. You have to look at what the products of that particular reasoning are. And that's a much better way of getting an understanding of what science is about. And what Crombie says is that if you do that, you can identify essentially six styles of thinking which make, they themselves don't make science dis distinctive, it's what they use to do the thinking that makes the science distinctive. So scientists engage in mathematical deduction or deductive arguments, they engage in experimental exploration in, in that sense. And each of these styles you can identify with somebody who brings it into being. Mathematics is obviously the Greek. Experimental exploration is essentially Galileo. Then there's hypothesis and model building very much associated with Galileo to start with. Then there's probabilistic and statistical thinking which is undervalued associated with people like Laplace and Gauss. Uh, and uh, then I've forgotten the fifth one, sorry, but the last one is evolutionary and genetic thinking, which is obviously associated with Darwin, but there's arguments about, this is always the abductive argument, the inference to the best possible explanation in that sense. Given what we now see, how could this have come to be, uh, is what, what, what it's about. So uh, those styles all enable forms of argument with particular resources, and they also do something which I think increasingly we have to do in the science curriculum, which is to recognize there is no universal homogeneous science. They are diverse in that sense, and it would be better if we called it the sciences curriculum uh, because of the different ways in which each of the sciences approaches particular uh, problems and the different forms of reasoning they em emphasize. I hope that's given you a bit of an answer. Well, thank you so very much, Jonathan, for this absolutely delightful and enlightening keynote. 
My question is, um, schools are somehow in their very structure meant to, um, well, teach children in a sense about what is true and that is a problem because you're making a point that uh, for argumentation in science, for, for multi-perspectivity and how argumentation should be a practice in education. And now there is an issue that students as well as teachers understand that what their task is is to learn what is right. And from a student perspective you would think what I have to do is just to repeat what the teacher is saying because that is what is correct. And that's an issue for argumentation, isn't it? And I would simply like to ask you, um, what is your take on that as, um, in terms of what kind of pedagogies, what is it that the teacher could do to counter that or to, to address that? I'm personally, um, thinking along uh, the lines of collaborative learning and yet another publication of uh, Schwarz and Osterhahn when, uh, <laughs> when uh, uh, two wrongs can make a right if they argue with each other. <laughs> oh no, sorry, uh, Krista is, is shaking her, so it's only Baruch, <laughs> sorry. Um, so anyway, I, I wanted to ask you that, what would you say? I mean, yeah, I think what you're pointing to is a kind of a fundamental issue of a, of a, a value okay, that is embedded uh, in what you might call the cultural practice of much education, the focus on right answers. And, uh, you, know, I, I've, you know, I've got, you know, the position I occupy and say is that, okay, you you really don't have secure knowledge if you cannot explain to me why the wrong answer is wrong in, in that sense. And you can only explain to me why the wrong answer is wrong if you've engaged in considering the, you know, the wrong answer versus the, the, the right answer in, in, in that sense. Uh, and the, the whole of... Um, there are many things that have gone on in science education in the past 30, 40 years. One of the big movements is the movements around uh, constructivist learning and misconceptions uh, that students have. Uh, and student, teachers who have an understanding, ev research evidence shows, paper by Sadler, that teachers who have an understanding of what the common uh, misconceptions that students have are, Okay, lead and address those by looking at the arguments for why they are wrong. Okay, uh, have students who learn more effectively for the majority of cases. It's the middle and high ones didn't make such a difference for the for the low able students. Uh, the, likewise, as I pointed to, I think the work on refutation texts, which deliberately includes discussion of why the wrong answer is wrong leads to better learning outcomes in that kind of way. And this is, you know, good empirical evidence. Uh, and when we have good empirical evidence, I think as a research community, okay, we have to promote it and use it in our uh, arguments uh, in this kind of way. I mean, yes, in my career, I have often uh, had teachers say to me, well, what do I do? I'm worried if we open up this discussion that uh, students will uh, you know, come away with, the, they'll argue themselves into the wrong idea. Well, obviously, in some senses, to that extent, it's always the responsibility of the teacher to challenge that kind of thinking in the best way that they can. Um, this is a bit of an anecdote, but you know, the thing that amused me once was uh, a teacher who said, well, every year I have to teach them about the land, men landing on the moon, and every year the kids say to me, oh, sir, you know, don't you understand? It's a conspiracy. Okay, it never happened. Okay. And he said, I found myself arguing to, for the case. And he found it wearing. So after about <clears throat> 10 years of this, he thought, he said to them, okay, I have to teach you about men landing on the moon. Okay. But yes, you know, the whole thing is a conspiracy. It's a fake. Okay. And all the children say, oh, no, it's not, sir. It is. Okay. In that sense. I, I, you know, I think... What I'm looking for is an opening up of that dialogic space where it's not just about this is what you are supposed to know, learn it and reproduce it. Because 
uh, for too many people, and I think fundamentally my commitment to this goes to my own method of learning, which is if somebody asks me to memorize something, I cannot do it, okay? It's useless, so I, okay, in, in that sense. Uh, I remember it for about 20, 24 hours, and then I forget it. But if I engage in cognitive processing about it, I will remember it for a long, much longer period of time. Uh, and I think one has to appeal to uh, teachers' understanding of how they learn themselves to challenge that particular issue. Uh, thank you very much, Jonathan, for this illuminative um, keynote. Um, when, when listening to you, uh, as a non-expert, not being an expert in science education, I'm impressed by the many examples of uh, how deep this argumentation is rooted in the knowledge and understanding of scientific concepts. Um, as a researcher who's doing more general work on it on, on classroom teaching, I would be interested about the relationship with, between these arguments in science with more general student dispositions, uh, which might be a kind of a